This is the long two-hour word-for-word reading of the Battle of Thapsus by Caesar. There's also a short 25-minute summary and a 40-minute academic discussion of why the battle is in northeast Tunisia rather than at the accepted location 70 miles further south. You can find all these links and more in the video description. The African Wars by Julius Caesar, translated by W.A. McDevitt and W.S. Bond, Chapter 1. Caesar, advancing by moderate journeys and continuing his march without intermission, arrived at Lilibaeum on the 14th day before the Calends of January. Desiring to embark immediately, though he had only one legion of new levies, and not quite 600 horse, he ordered his tent to be pitched so near the seaside that the waves lashed to the very foot of it. This he did with a view that none should think he had time to delay, and that his men might be kept in readiness at a day's or an hour's warning. Though the wind at that time was contrary, he nevertheless detained the soldiers and mariners on board, that he might lose no opportunity of sailing. The rather, because the forces of the enemy were announced by the inhabitants of the province to consist of innumerable cavalry, not to be numbered, four legions headed by Juba, together with a great body of light-armed troops, ten legions under, under Scipio, a hundred and twenty elephants, and fleets in abundance. Yet he was not alarmed nor lost his confident hopes and spirits. Meantime, the number of galleys and transports increased daily. The new levied legions flocked into him from all parts, among the rest the fifth, a veteran legion, and about two thousand horse. Having got together six legions and about two thousand horse, he embarked the legions as fast as they arrived in the galleys, and the cavalry in the transports then sending the greatest part of the fleet before with orders to sail for the island of Aponiana, not far from Lilibaeum. He himself continued a little longer in Sicily, and exposed to public sale some confiscated estates. Leaving all other affairs to the care of Alienus the praetor, who then commanded in the island, and strictly charging him to use the utmost expedition in embarking the remainder of the troops, he set sail the sixth day before the calends of January, and soon came up with the rest of the fleet. As the wind was favorable and afforded a quick passage, he arrived the fourth day within sight of Africa, attended by a few galleys. For the transports, being mostly dispersed and scattered by the winds, with the exception of a few, were driven different ways. Passing Clapea and Neapolis with the fleet, he continued for some time to coast along the shore, leaving many towns and castles behind him. Chapter 3 After he came before Adramedum, where the en enemy had a garrison commanded by Gaius Considius, and where Gnaeus Piso appeared upon the shore towards Clopea with the cavalry of Adramedum and about 3,000 moors, he stopped a while, facing the port, till the rest of the fleet should come up, and then landed his men, though their, their number at that time did not exceed 3,000 foot and 150 horse. There, encamped before the town, he continued quiet without offering any act of hostility, and, rest and restrained all from plunder. Meanwhile, the inhabitants manned the walls and assembled in great numbers before the gate to defend themselves, their garrison within amounting to two legions. Caesar, having ridden round the town and thoroughly examined its situation, returned to his camp. Some blamed his conduct on this occasion and charged him with a considerable oversight in not appointing a place of meeting to the pilots and captains of the fleet, or delivering them sealed instructions according to his usual custom, which being opened at a certain time might have directed them to assemble at a specified place. But in this Caesar acted not without design, for he knew of no port in Africa that was clear of the enemy's forces, and where the fleet might rendezvous in security. He chose to rely entirely upon fortune, and land where occasion offered." Chapter 4. In the meantime, Lucius Plancus, one of, the C one of Caesar's lieutenants, desired leave to treat with Considius and try, if possible, to bring him to reason. Leave being granted accordingly, he wrote him a letter and sent it into the town by a captive. When the captive arrived and presented the letter, Considius, before he received it, demanded whence it came, and being told, from Caesar, the Roman general answered that he knew no general of the Roman forces but Scipio. Then, commanding the messenger to be immediately slain in his presence, he delivered the letter, unread and unopened, to a trusty partisan with orders to carry it directly to Scipio. Chapter 5 
Caesar had now continued a day and a night before the town without receiving any answer from Considius. The rest of the forces were not yet arrived. His cavalry was not considerable. He had not sufficient troops with him to invest the place, and these were new levies. Neither did he think it advisable, upon the, his first landing, to expose, the army, to expose the army to wounds and fatigue, more especially as the town was strongly fortified and extremely difficult of access, and a great body of horse was said to be upon the point of arrival to succor the inhabitants. He therefore thought it advisable not to remain and besiege the town, lest while he pursued that design the enemy's cavalry should come behind and surround him. Chapter 6 but as he was drawing off his men, the garrison made a sudden sally, and the cavalry, which had been sent by Juba to receive their pay, happening just then to come up, they took possession of the camp Caesar had left behind, and began to harass his rear. This being perceived, the legionaries immediately halted, and the cavalry, though few in number, boldly charged to the vast multitude of the enemy. An incredible event occurred, that less than thirty Gallic horse repulsed two thousand Moors, and drove them into the town. Having thus repulsed the enemy, and compelled them to retire behind their walls, Caesar resumed his intended march. But observing that they often repeated their sallies, renewing the pursuit from time to time, and again fleeing when attacked by the horse, he posted a few of the veteran cohorts, cohorts which he had with him, with part of the cavalry in the rear, and so proceeded slowly on his march. The further he advanced from the town, the less eager were the Numidians to pursue. Meantime, deputies arrived from the several towns and castles on the road, offering to furnish him with corn and to perform whatever he might command. Toward the evening of that day, which was the calends of January, he fixed his camp at Ruspina. Chapter 7 Thence he removed and came before Leptis, a free city, and governed by its own laws. Here he was met by deputies from the town who, in the name of their inhabitants, offered their free submission, whereupon placing centurions and a garrison before the gates to prevent the soldiers from entering, or whereupon placing centurions and a guard before the gates to prevent the soldiers from entering, or offering violence to any of the inhabitants, he himself encamped towards the shore, not far distant from the town. Hither, by accident, arrived some of the galleys and transports, by whom he was informed that the rest of the fleet, uncertain what course to pursue, had been steering for Utica. In the meantime, Caesar could not depart from the sea, nor seek the inland provinces, on account of the error committed by the fleet. He likewise sent the cavalry back to their ships, probably to hinder the country from being plundered, and ordered fresh water to be carried to them on board. Meanwhile, the Moorish horse rose suddenly, Caesar's party not expecting it, on the rowers who had been employed in carrying water as they came out of the ships, and wounded many with their darts, and killed some. For the manner of these barbarians is to lie in ambush with their horses among the valleys, and suddenly launch upon an enemy. They're, they seldom choose to engage hand to hand in a plain. Chapter 8 In the meantime, Caesar dispatched letters and messengers into Sardinia and the neighboring provinces with orders as soon as they read the letters to send supplies of men, corn, and warlike stores, and having unloaded part of the fleet, detached it with Rabirius Posthumus into Sicily to bring over the second embarkation. At the same time, he ordered out ten galleys to get intelligence of the transports that had missed their way, and to maintain the freedom of the sea. He also ordered Gaius Celestius Prispus, the praetor, at the head of a squadron, to sail to Cursina, an island, then in the hands of the enemy, because he heard there was great quantity of corn in that island. He gave these orders and instructions in such a manner as to leave no room for excuse or delay. Meanwhile, having informed himself from the deserters and natives of the condition of Scipio and his followers, and understanding that they were at the whole charge of maintaining Juba's cavalry, he could not but pity the infatuation of men who thus chose to be tributaries to the king of Numidia, rather than securely enjoy their fortunes at home with their fellow citizens. Chapter 9 Caesar moved his camp on the third day before the nones of January, and leaving six cohorts at Leptis under the command of Caserna, returned with the rest of the forces to Rispina, from which he came, had come the day before. Here he deposited the baggage of the army, 
and marching out with a light body of, body of troops to forage, ordered the inhabitants to follow with their horses and carriages. Having by this means got together a great quantity of corn, he came back to Ruspina. I think that he acted with this intention, that by keeping possession of the maritime cities and providing them with garrisons, he might secure a retreat for his fleet. Chapter 10. Leaving, therefore, Publius Cicerna, and brother of him who commanded at Leptis, to take charge of the town, with one legion, he orders all the wood that could be found to be carried into the place and set out in person from Ruspina with seven cohorts, part of the veteran legions, who had behaved so well in the fleet under Sulpicius and Vatinius, and marching directly for the port, which lies at about two miles distance, embarked with them in the evening, without imparting his intentions to the army, who were extremely inquisitive concerning the general's design. His de departure occasioned the utmost sadness and consternation among the troops, for being few in number, mostly new levies, and those not all suffered to land, they saw themselves exposed upon a foreign coast to the mighty forces of a crafty nation supported by an innumerable cavalry. Nor had they any resource in their present circumstances or expectation of safety in their own conduct, but derived all their hope from the alacrity, vigor, and wonderful cheerfulness that appeared in their general's countenance. For he was of an intrepid spirit and behaved with undaunted resolution and confidence. On his conduct, therefore, they entirely relied, and hoped to a man that by his skill and talents all difficulties would vanish before them. Chapter 11. Caesar, having continued the whole night on board, prepared to set sail about daybreak, when, all of a sudden, the part of the fleet that had caused so much anxiety appeared unexpectedly in view, wherefore ordering his men to quit their ships immediately and receive the rest of the troops in arms upon the shore, he made the new fleet enter the port with the utmost diligence, and landing all the forces, horse and foot, returned again to Respina. Here he established his camp, and taking with him thirty cohorts without baggage, advanced into the country to forage. Thus was Caesar's purpose at length discovered, that he meant, unknown to the enemy, to have sailed to the assistance of the transports that had missed their way, lest they should unexpectedly fall in with the African fleet, and he did not wish his own soldiers who were left behind in garrison to know this, lest they should be intimidated by their smallness of their numbers and the multitude of the enemy. Chapter 12 Caesar had not marched above three miles from his camp when he was informed by his scouts and some advanced parties of horse that the enemy's forces were in view. As soon as this announcement was made, a great cloud of dust began to appear. Upon this intelligence, Caesar ordered all his horse, of which he had at that time but a very small number, to advance, as likewise his archers, only a few of whom had followed him from the camp, and the legions to, mark, to march quietly after him in order of battle, while he went forward at the head of a small party. Soon after, having discovered the enemy at some distance, he commanded the soldiers to repair to their arms and to prepare for battle. Their number in all did not exceed thirty cohorts with 400 horse and 150 archers. Chapter 13. Meanwhile, the enemy, under the command of Labienus and the two Pisidii, drew up with a very large front, consisting not so much of foot as of horse, whom they intermixed with light-armed Numidians and archers, forming themselves in such close order that Caesar's army, at a distance, mistook them all for infantry, and strengthening their right and left with many squadrons of horse. Caesar drew up his army in a single line, being obliged to do so by the smallness of his numbers, covering his front with his archers, and placing his cavalry on the right and left wings, with particular instructions not to suffer themselves to be surrounded by the enemy's numerous horse, for he imagined that he would have to fight only with infantry. Chapter 14 As both sides stood in expectation of the signal, and Caesar would not stir from his post, as he saw that with such few troops against so great a force, he must de depend more on stratagem than strength. On a sudden, the enemy's horse began to extend themselves and move in a lateral direction so as to encompass the hills and weaken Caesar's horse, and at the same time to surround them. The latter could scarcely keep their ground against their numbers. Meanwhile, both the main bodies advancing to engage the enemy's cavalry 
intermixed with some light-armed Numidians, suddenly sprang forward from their crowded troops and attacked the legions with a shower of darts. Our men, preparing to return the charge, their horse retreated a little, while the foot continued to maintain their ground, till the others, having rallied, came on again with fresh vigor to, to sustain them. Chapter 15 Caesar perceived that his ranks were in danger of being broken by this new way of fighting, for our ho foot, in pursuing the enemy's horse, having advanced a considerable way beyond their colors, were wounded in the flank by the nearest Numidian darts, while the enemy's horse easily escaped our infantry's javelins by flight. He therefore gave express orders that no soldiers should advance above four feet beyond the ensigns. Meanwhile, Labienus's cavalry, confining in their, confiding in their numbers, endeavored to surround those of Caesar, who, being few in number and, empower, and overpowered by the multitude of the enemy, were forced to give ground a little, their horses being much wounded. The enemy pressed on more and more, so that in an instant the legions, being surrounded on all sides by the enemy's cavalry, were obliged to form themselves into a circle and fight as if enclosed with the barriers. Chapter 16 Labianus, with his head uncovered, advanced on horseback to the front of the battle, sometimes encouraging his own men, sometimes addressing Caesar's legions thus. Ho, ho! So you raw soldiers there, says he. Why so fierce? Has he infatuated you too with his words? Truly he has brought you into a fine condition. I pity you sincerely. Upon this, one of the soldiers said, I am none of your raw warriors, Labianus, but a veteran of the 10th legion. Where's your standard, repi replied Labianus. I'll soon make you sensible who I am, re answered the soldier. And then pulling off his helmet to discover himself, he threw a javelin with all his strength at Labianus, which wounding his horse severely in the breast, No, Labianus, says he, that this dart was thrown by a soldier of the 10th legion. However, the whole army was not a little daunted, especially the new levies, and began to cast their eyes upon Caesar, minding nothing for the present but to defend themselves from the enemy's darts. Chapter 17 Caesar, meanwhile, perceiving the enemy's design, endeavored to extend his line of battle as much as possible, directing the cohorts to face about alternately to the right and left. By this means he broke the enemy's circle with his right and left wings, and attacking one part of them, thus separated from the other, with his horse and foot, at last put them to flight. He pursued them but a little way, fearing an ambush, and returned again to his own men. The same was done to the other division of Caesar's horse and foot, so that the enemy, being driven back and severely wounded on all sides, he retreated towards his camp in order of battle. Chapter 18 Meanwhile, Marcus Petraeus and Gnaeus Piso, with 1,100 select Numidian horse and a considerable body of foot, arrived to the assistance of the enemy, who, recovering from their terror upon this reinforcement, and again resuming courage, fell upon the rear of the legions as they retreated, and endeavored to hinder them from reaching their camp. Caesar, perceiving this, ordered his men to wheel about and renew the battle in the middle of the, pl of the plain. Although the enemy still pursued their former plan and avoided a closing engagement, and the horses of Caesar's cavalry had not yet recovered the fatigue of their voyage, and were besides weakened with thirst, weariness, wounds, and of course unfit for a vigorous and long pursuit, which even the time of day would not allow, he ordered both horse and foot to fall at once briskly upon the enemy and not slacken the pursuit till they had driven them quite beyond the furthest hills and taken possession of them themselves. Accordingly, upon a single signal being given, when the enemy were throwing their javelins in a faint and careless manner, he suddenly charged them with his horse and foot, who, in a moment, driving them from the field and over the adjoining hill, kept possession of that post for some time, and then retired slowly in order of battle to their camp. The enemy, who in this last attack had been very roughly handled, then at length retreated to their own fortifications. Chapter 19 Meanwhile, the action being over, a great number of deserters of all kinds flocked to Caesar's camp, besides multitudes of horse and foot that were made prisoner. From them we learned that it was the design of the enemy to have astonished our raw troops with their new and uncommon manner of fighting, and after surrounding them with their cavalry to have cut them to pieces, as they had done Curio and that they had marched against us expressly with that intention. Labienus had even said in the council of war that he would lead such a numerous body of auxiliaries against his adversaries 
as should fatigue us with the very slaughter and defeat us even in the bosom of victory, for he relied more on the number than the valor of his troops. He had heard of the mutiny of the veteran legions at Rome and their refusal to go into Africa, and was likewise well assured of the fidelity of his troops, who had served three years under him in Africa. He had a great number of Numidian cavalry and light-armed troops, besides the Gallic and German horse whom he had drawn together out of the remains of Pompey's army and carried over with him from Brundisium. He had likewise the freedmen raised in the country and trained to use bridled horses. He also, and also the immense number of Juba's forces, his hundred and twenty elephants, his innumerable cavalry and legionaries amounting to about twelve thousand. Emboldened by the hope that such mighty forces raised in him, on the day before the nones of January, three days after Caesar, Caesar's arrival, he came against him with sixteen hundred Gallic and German horse, nine hundred under Petraeus, eight thousand Numidians, four times that number of light-armed foot, with a multitude of archers and slingers. The battle lasted from the fifth hour till sunset, during which time Petraeus, receiving a dangerous wound, was obliged to quit the field. Chapter 20 Meantime, Caesar fortified his camp with much greater care, reinforced the guards, and threw up two entrenchments, one from Ruspinaquite to the sea, the other from his camp to the sea, likewise, to secure the communication and receive supplies without danger. He landed a great number of darts and military engines, and armed part of the mariners, Gauls, Rhodians, and others, that after the example of the enemy, he might have a number of light-armed troops to intermix with his cavalry. He likewise strengthened his army with a great number of Syrian and Iterian archers, whom he drew from his, the fleet into his camp. For he understood that within three days, Scipio was expected to unite his forces to Labienus and Petraeus, and his army was said to consist of eight legions and three thousand horse. At the same time, he established workshops, made a great number of darts and arrows, provided himself with leaden bullets and palisades, wrote to Sicily for hurdles and wood to make rams, because he had none in Africa, and likewise gave orders for sending corn, for the harvest in that country was likely to be inconsiderable, the enemy having taken all the laborers into their service the year before, and stored up the grain in a few fortified towns, after demolishing the rest, forcing the inhabitants into the garrisoned places, and exhausting the whole country. Chapter 21 In this necessity, by paying court to private individuals, he obtained a small supply, and husbanded it with care. In the meantime, he went around the works in person daily, and kept about four cohorts constantly on duty, on account of the multitude of the enemy. Labian has sent his sick and wounded, of which the number was very considerable, in wagons to Adramedum. Meanwhile, Caesar's transports, unacquainted with the coast or where the general had landed, wandered up and down in great uncertainty, and being attacked one after another by the enemy's coasters, were for the most part either taken or burned. Caesar, being informed of this, stationed his fleet along the coast and islands for the, for the security of his convoys. Chapter 22 Meanwhile, Marcus Cato, who had commanded in Utica, never ceased urging and exhorting young Pompey in words to this effect. Your father, when he was at your age, and observed the commonwealth oppressed by wicked and daring men, and the party of order either slain or driven into banishment from their country and relations, incited by the greatness of his mind and love of glory, though then very young and only a private man, had yet the courage to rally the remains of his father's army and assert the freedom of Italy and Rome, which was almost crushed forever. He also recovered Sicily, Africa, Numidia, Mauritania with amazing dispatch, and that, and by that means gained an illustrious and extensive reputation among all nations, and triumphed while very young and only a Roman knight. Nor did he enter upon the administration of public affairs, distinguished by the shining exploits of his father, or the fame and reputation of his ancestors, or the honors and dignities of the state. Will you, on the contrary, possessed of these honors and the, re and the reputation acquired by your father, sufficiently distinguished by your own industry and greatness of mind, not bestir yourself, not join your father's friends, not give the earnestly required assistance to yourself and the republic and every man of worth? Chapter 23. The youth roused by the remonstrances of that grave and worthy senator, got together about thirty sail, 
of all sorts, of which some few were ships of war, and sailing from Utica to Mauritania, invaded the kingdom of Bogud, and leaving his baggage behind him with an army of 2,000 men, partly freedmen, partly slaves, some armed, some not, approached the town of Ascurum, in which the king had a garrison. On the arrival of Pompey, the inhabitants suffered him to advance to the very walls and gates, when suddenly, sallying out, they drove back his troops in confusion and dismay to the sea and their ships. This ill success determined him to leave the coast, nor did he afterward land in any place, but steered it directly for the Balearic Islands. Chapter 24 Meantime, Scipio, comma, leaving a strong garrison at Utica, began his march with the forces we have described above, and encamped at first at Adramedium, and then, after a stay of a few days setting out in the night, he joined Petraeus and Labienus, lodging all the forces in one camp about three miles distant from Caesar's. Their cavalry made continual excursions to our very works, and intercepted those who had ventured out too far in quest of wood or water, and obliged us to keep within our entrenchments. This soon occasioned a great scarcity of provisions among Caesar's men, because no supplies had yet arrived from Sicily and Sardinia. The season, too, was dangerous for navigation, and he did not possess above six miles in each direction in Africa, and was moreover greatly distressed for want of forage. The veteran soldiers and cavalry, who had been engaged in many wars, both by sea and land, and often struggled with wants and misfortune of this kind, gathering seaweed and washing it in fresh water, by that means subsisted their horses and cattle. Chapter 25 While things were in this situation, King Juba, being form informed of Caesar's difficulties, and the few troops he had with him, resolved not to allow him time to remedy his wants or increase his forces. Accordingly, he left his kingdom at the head of a large body of horse and foot and marched to his allies. <laughs> Meantime, Paulus Sitius and King Bogud, having intelligence of Juba's march, joined their forces, entered Numidia, and laying siege to Cirta, the most opulent city in the con county, carried it in a few days, with two others belonging to the Getulians. They had offered the inhabitants, Getulians are where the desert dwellers. They had offered the inhabitants leave to depart in safety if they would peaceably deliver up the town. But these conditions being rejected, they were taken by storm and the citizens all put to the sword. They continued to advance and incessantly harassed the country and cities, of which Juba, having intelligence, though he was upon the point of joining Scipio and the other chiefs, determined that it was better to march back to the relief of his own kingdom than run the hazard of being driven from it while he was assisting others, and perhaps, after all, miscarry too in his designs against Caesar. He therefore retired with his troops, leaving only thirty elements, elephants behind him, and marched to the relief of his own cities and territories. Chapter 26 Meanwhile, Caesar, as there was a doubt in the province concerning his arrival, and no one believed that he had come in person, but that some of his lieutenants had come over with the forces lately sent, dispatched letters to all the several states to inform them of his presence. Upon this, many persons of rank fled to his camp, complaining of the barbarity and cruelty of the enemy. Caesar, deeply touched by their tears and complaints, although before he had remained inactive, resolved to take the field as soon as the weather would permit, and he could draw his troops together. He immediately dispatched letters into Sicily, to Alienus and Rabirius Posthumus, the praetors, to tell them that without delay or excuse, either of the winter or of the wind, they must send over the rest of the troops to save Africa from utter ruin, because without some speedy remedy, not a single house would be left standing, nor anything escape the fury and ravages of the enemy. And he himself was so anxious and impatient that from the day the letters were sent, he complained without ceasing of the delay of the fleet, and had his eyes night and day turned towards the sea. Nor was it wonderful, for he saw the villages burned, the country laid waste, and the cattle destroyed, the towns plundered, the principal citizens either slain or put in chains, and their children dragged into servitude under the name of hostages. Nor could he, amid all this scene of misery, afford any relief to those who implored his protection on account of the small number of his forces. In the meantime, he kept the soldiers incessantly at work upon the entrenchments, built forts and redoubts, and carried on his lines quite to the sea. 
Chapter 27. Meanwhile, Scipio made use of the following contrivance for training and disciplining his ele elephants. He drew up two parties in order of battle, one of slingers, who were to act as enemies, and dis discharge small stones against the elephants, and fronting them, the elephants themselves, in one line, and his whole army behind him in battle array, that when the enemy, by their discharge of stones, had frightened the elephants and forced them to turn upon their own men, they might again be made to face the enemy by the volleys of stones from the army behind them. The work, however, went on but slowly, because these animals, after many years of training, are dangerous to both parties when brought into the field. Chapter 28 While the two generals were thus employed near Respinia, Gaius Virgilius, a man of the Praetorian rank, who commanded in Thapsus, a maritime city, observing some of Caesar's transports that had missed their way, uncertain where Caesar had landed or held his camp, and thinking that a fair opportunity offered of destroying them, manned a galley that was in the port with soldiers and archers, and joining with it a few armed barks, began to pursue Caesar's ships. Though he was repulsed on several occasions, he still pursued his design, and at last fell in with one, on board of which were two young Spaniards, of the name of Titius, who were tribunes of the Fifth Legion, and whose father had been made a senator by Caesar. There was with them a centurion of the same legion, Titus Salianus by name, who had invested the house of Marcus Messala, Caesar's lieutenant at Messana, and made use of very seditious language. Nay, he had even seized the money and ornaments destined for Caesar's triumphs, and for that reason dreaded his resentment. He, conscious of his demerits, persuaded the young men to surrender themselves to Virgilius, by whom they were sent under a strong guard to Scipio, and three days after put to death. It is said that the elder Titius begged of the centurions who were charged with the execution that he might be first put to death, which, being easily granted, they both suffered according to their sentence. Chapter 29. The cavalry that mounted guard in the two camps were continuously skirmishing with one another. Sometimes, too, the German and Gallic cavalry of Labienus entered into discourse with those of Caesar, after promising not to injure one another. Meantime, Labienus, with a party of horse, endeavored to surprise the town of Leptus, which Cicerna guarded with three cohorts, but was easily repulsed, because the town was strongly fortified and well provided with warlike engines. He, however, renewed the attempt several times. One day, as a strong squadron of the enemy had posted themselves b before the gate, their officer being slain by an arrow discharged from a crossbow and pinned to his own shield, the rest were terrified and took to flight by which means the town was delivered from any further attempts. Chapter 30 At the same time, Scipio drew daily up his troops in order of battle, about three hundred paces from his camp, and after continuing in arms the greatest part of the day, retreated it again to his camp in the evening. This he did several times, no one meanwhile offering to stir out of Caesar's camp or approach his forces, which forbearance and tranquility gave him such a contempt of Caesar and his army, that drawing out all his forces and his thirty elephants, with towers on their backs, and extending his horse and foot as wide as pro possible, he approached quite up to Caesar's entrenchments. Chapter 31 Upon perceiving this, Caesar quietly, and without noise or confusion, recalled to his camp all that were gone out either in quest of forage, wood, or to work upon the fortifications. He likewise ordered the cavalry that were upon guard not to quit their post until the enemy were within reach of dart, and if they then persisted in advancing, to retire in good, or, good order within their entrenchments. He ordered the rest of the cavalry to be ready and armed, each in his own place. These orders were not given by himself in person, or after viewing the disposition of the enemy from the rampart, but such was his consummate knowledge of the art of war, that he gave all the necessary directions by his officers, he himself merely sitting in his tent, and informing himself of the motions of the enemy by his scouts. He very well knew that, whatever confidence the enemy might have in their numbers, they would yet never dare to attack the camp of a general who had so often repulsed, terrified, and put them to flight, who had frequently pardoned and granted them their lives, and whose very name and weight and authority enough to intimidate their army. He was, besides, well entrenched with a high rampart and deep ditch, the approaches to which were rendered so difficult by the sharp spikes, which he had disposed in a very skillful manner, that they were even sufficient of themselves to keep off the enemy. He had also a large supply of crossbows, engines, and all sorts of weapons necessary for a vigorous defense, which he had prepared on account of the fewness of his troops and the inexperience of his new levies. 
It was not owing to being influenced by the fear of the enemy or their numerical strength that he allowed himself to appear daunted in their estimation. And it was not owing to his having any doubts of gaining the victory that he did not lead his troops to action, although they were raw and few. But he thought that it was a matter of great importance what sort of victory should be. For he thought that it would disgrace him if, after so many noble exploits and defeating such powerful armies, and, if, and after gaining so many glorious victories, he should appear to have gained a bloody victory over the remnants who had rallied after their flight. He determined, in consequence of this, to endure the pride and exultation of his enemies until some portion of his veteran, veteran legion should arrive in the second embarkation. Chapter 32 Scipio, after a short stay before the entrenchments, as if in contempt of Caesar, withdrew slowly to his camp, and having called the soldiers together, enlarged upon the terror and despair of the enemy, when encouraging his men he assured them of a complete victory in a short time. Caesar made his soldiers again return to the works, and under pretense of fortifying his camp, inured the new levities to, la to labor and fatigue. Meantime, the Numidians and Getulians deserted daily from Scipio's camp. Part returned home, part came over to Caesar, because they understood he was related to Gaius Marius, from whom their ancestors had received considerable favors. Of these, he selected some of distinguished rank and sent them home with letters to their countrymen, exhorting them to levy troops for their own defense and not to listen to the suggestions of his enemies. Chapter 33 While these things were passing near Rispina, deputies from Achilla, or Asilla, a free town, and all the neighboring towns arrived in Caesar's camp and promised, quote, to be ready to execute Caesar's commands, and that they only begged and requested of him to give them garrisons that they might do so in safety and without danger to themselves, that they would furnish them with, with corn and whatever supplies they had to secure the common safety. Caesar readily complied with their demands, and having assigned a garrison, sent Gaius Messius, who had been ideal, to command in Asilla. Upon intelligence of this, Considius Longus, who was at Adramedum with two legions and seven hundred horse, leaving the, a garrison in that city, hastened to Asilla also at the head of eight cohorts. But Messius, having accomplished his march with greater speed, arrived there before him. When Considius therefore approached and found Caesar's garrison in possession of the town, not daring to make any attempt, he returned again to Adramedum. But some days after, Labienus, having sent him a reinforcement of horse, he began to besiege the town. Chapter 34. Much about the same time, Gaius Salistius Crispus, who, as we have seen, had been sent a few days before to Circina with a fleet, arrived in that island. Upon his arrival, Gaius Decimus the Quaestor, who, with a strong party of his own domestics, had charge of the magazines erected there, went on board a small vessel and fled. Salistius, meanwhile, was well received by the Circinaetes, and finding great store of corn in the island loaded all the ships then in the port, whose number was very considerable, and dispatched them to Caesar's camp. At the same time, Alienus, the proconsul, put on board of the transports at Lilibam the 13th and 14th legions, with 800 Gallic horse and a thousand archers and slingers, and sent the second embarkation to Africa to Caesar. This fleet, meeting with a favorable wind, arrived in four days at Rispina, where Caesar had his camp. Thus he experienced a double pleasure on this occasion, receiving at one, one and the same time both a supply of provisions and a reinforcement of troops, which animated the soldiers and delivered them from the apprehension of want. Having landed the legions and cavalry, he allowed them some time to recover from the fatigue and sickness of their voyage, and then distributed, the, distributed them into the forts and along the works. Chapter 35 Scipio and the other generals were greatly surprised at this conduct, and could not conceive why Caesar, who had always been forward and active in war, should all of a sudden change his measures, which they therefore suspected must proceed from some very powerful reasons. Uneasy and disturbed to see him so patient, they made choice of two Getulians, on whose fidelity they thought they could rely, <laughs> and promising them great rewards, sent them under the name of deserters to get intelligence of Caesar's designs. When they were brought before him, they begged they might have leave to speak without personal danger, which, being granted, quote, It is now a long time, great general, said they, since many of us Getulians, clients of Gaius Marius, and almost all Roman citizens of the Fourth and Sixth Legions, have wished for an opportunity to come over to you, but have hitherto been prevented by the guards of Numidian horse from doing it without great risk. 
Now we gladly embrace the occasion, being sent by Scipio under the name of deserters to discover what ditches and traps you have prepared for his elephants, how you intended to oppose these animals, and what dispositions you are making for battle. They were praised by Caesar and liberally rewarded and sent to the other deserters. We had soon a proof of the truth of what they had advanced, for the next day a great many soldiers of these legions, mentioned by the Catulians, deserted to Caesar's camp. Chapter 36 While affairs were in this posture at Rispina, Marcus Cato, who commanded in Utica, was daily enlisting freedmen, Africans, slaves, and all that were of age to bear arms, and sending them without intermission to Scipio's camp. Meanwhile, deputies from the town of Tisra came to Caesar to inform him inform him that some Italian merchants had brought 300,000 bushels of corn into that city, and to demand a garrison as well for their own defense and to secure the corn. Caesar thanked the deputies, promised to send the garrison they desired, and having encouraged them, sent them back to their fellow citizens. Meantime, Paulus Sitius entered Numidia with his troops, and took by storm a castle situated on a mountain, where Juba had laid up a great quantity of provisions, and other necessaries for carrying on the war. Chapter 37 Caesar, having increased his forces with two veteran legions and all the cavalry and light-armed troops that had arrived in the second embarkation, detached six transports to Lilibaeum to bring over the rest of the army. He himself, on the sixth day before the calends of February, ordered the scouts and lictors to attend him at six in the evening, drew out all the legions at midnight, and directed his march toward Rispina where he had a garrison, and which had first declared in his favor, no one knowing or having the least suspicion of his design. From there, he continued his route by the left of the camp, along the sea, and passed a little declivity, or a hill, or slope, which opened into a fine plain, extending fifteen miles, and bordering upon a chain of mountains of moderate height, that formed a kind of theater. In this ridge were some hills that rose higher than the rest, on which forts and watchtowers had formerly been erected, and at the furthest of which Scipio's guards and outposts were stationed. Chapter 38. After Caesar had gained the ridge, which I have just mentioned, and began to raise redoubts upon the several eminences, which he executed in less than half an hour, and, and when he was not very far from the last, which bordered on the enemy's camp, and where, as we have said, Scipio had his outguard of Numidians, he stopped a moment, and having taken a view of the ground, and posted his cavalry in the most commodious situation, he ordered the legions to throw up an entrenchment along the middle of the ridge, from the place at which he had arrived to that from which he had set out. When Scipio and Labienus observed this, they drew all their cavalry out of their camp, formed them in order of battle, and advancing about a mile, posted their infantry by way of a second line, somewhat less than half a mile from their camp. Chapter 39 Caesar was unmoved by the appearance of the enemy's forces and encouraged his men to go on with the work. But when he perceived that they were within 1,500 paces of the entrenchment and saw that the enemy was coming nearer to interrupt and disturb the soldiers and oblige him to draw off the legions from the work, he ordered a squadron of Spanish cavalry, supported by some light-armed infantry, to attack the Numidian guard upon the nearest eminence and drive them from that post. They accordingly advanced rapidly, attacked the Numidian cavalry, they took some of them alive, severely wounded several in their flight, and made themselves masters of the place. This being observed by Labienus, he wheeled off almost the whole right wing of the horse, that he might the more effectually succor the fugitives. Caesar waited till he was at a considerable distance from his own men, and then detached his left wing to intercept the enemy. Chapter 40 In the plain where this happened was a large villa with four turrets which prevented Labianus from seeing that he was intercepted by Caesar's cavalry. He had therefore no apprehension of the approach of Caesar's horse till he found himself charged in the rear, which struck such a sudden terror into the Numidian cavalry that they immediately betook themselves to flight. The Gauls and Germans who stood their ground, being surrounded on all sides, were entirely cut off. This being perceived by Scipio's legions, who were drawn up in order of battle before the camp, they fled in the utmost terror and confusion. Scipio and his forces being driven from the plain and hills, Caesar sounded a retreat and ordered all the cavalry to retire behind the works. When the field was cleared, he could not forbear admiring the huge bodies of the Gauls and Germans, who had been partly induced by the authority of Labianus to follow him out of Gaul, and partly drawn over by promises and rewards. 
some being made prisoners in the battle with Curio and having their lives granted them, continued faithful out of gratitude. Their bodies of surprising symmetry and size lay scattered all over the plain. Chapter 41 the next day, Caesar drew all his forces together and formed them in order of battle upon the plain. Scipio, discouraged by so unexpected a check, and the numbers of his wounded and slain, kept within his lines. Caesar, with his army in battle array, marched along the roots of the hills and gradually approached his trenches. Caesar's legions were by this time not more than a mile from Uzita, a town possessed by Scipio, when the latter, fearing lest he should lose the town, Whence, from which he procured water and other conveniences for his army, resolved, therefore, to preserve it at all hazards, and brought forth his whole army and drew them up in four lines, forming the first of cavalry, supported by elephantry with elephants with castles on their backs. Caesar, believing that Scipio approached with the intention of giving battle, continued where he was posted, not far from the town. Scipio, meanwhile, having the town in the center of his front, extended his two wings, where were his elephants, in full view of our army. Chapter 42 When Caesar had waited till sunset, without finding that Scipio stirred from his post, who seemed rather disposed to defend himself by his advantageous situation than the hazard of battle in the open field, he did not think proper to advance further that day, because the enemy had a strong garrison of Numidians in the town, which besides covered the center of their front, and he foresaw great difficulty in forming at the same time an attack upon the town and opposing their right and left with the advantage of the ground, especially as the soldiers had continued under arms and fasted since morning. Having therefore led back his troops to their camp, he resolved next day to extend his lines nearer the town. Chapter 43 Meantime, Considius, who was besieging eight mercenary cohorts of Numidians and Getulians in Asala, where Paulus Messius commanded, after continuing long before the place, and seeing all his works burned and destroyed by the enemy, upon the report of the late battle of the cavalry, set fire to his corn, destroyed his wine, oil, and other stores which were necessary for the maintain maintenance of his army, and, abandoning the siege of Asilla, divided his forces with Scipio and retired through the kingdom of Juba to Adramedum. Chapter 44 Meanwhile, one of the transports, being belonging to the second embarkation which Alienus had sent from Sicily, in which were Quintus Cominius and Lucius Ticida, a Roman knight, being separated from the rest of the fleet in a storm and driven to Thapsus, was taken by Virgilius and all the persons on board sent to Scipio. A three-banked galley likewise, belonging to the same fleet, being forced by the winds of Agimurum, was intercepted by the squadron under Varus and Marcus Octavius. In this vessel were some veteran soldiers with a centurion and a few new levies, whom Varus treated without insult and sent them under a guard to Scipio. When they came into his presence and appeared before his tribunal, I am satisfied, said he. It is not by your own inclination, but at the instigation of your wicked general that you impiously wage war on your fellow citizens and every man of worth. If, therefore, now that fortune has put you in our power, you will take this opportunity to unite with the good citizens and in the defense of the commonwealth. I am determined to give you life and money. Therefore, speak openly your sentiments. Chapter 45 Scipio, having ended his speech and expecting a thankful return to so gracious an offer, permitted them to reply. One of their number, a centurion of the 14th legion, thus addressed him. Scipio, says he, for I cannot give you the appellation of general. I return you my hearty thanks for the good treatment you are willing to show to prisoners of war, and perhaps I might accept of your kindness were it not to be purchased at the expense of a horrible crime. What? Shall I carry arms and fight against Caesar, my general, of whom I have served as a centurion, and against his victorious army, to whose renown I have for more than thirty-six years endeavored to contribute by my valor? It is what I will never do. I even advise you not to push the war any further. You know not what troops you have to deal with, nor the difference between them and yours, of which, if you please, I will give you an indisputable example. Do you, therefore, pick out the best cohort you have in your army, and give me only ten of my comrades, who are now your prisoners, to engage them? You shall see by this outcome what you are to expect from your soldiers. Chapter 46 
When the centurion had courageously made this reply, Scipio, incensed at his boldness and resenting the affront, made a sign to some of his officers to kill him on the spot, which was immediately put in execution. At the same time, ordering the other veterans to be separated from the new lovies, carry away, he said, these men, contaminated by the pollution of, the, of crime and pampered with the blood of their fellow citizens. Accordingly, they were conducted without the rampart and cruelly massacred. The new race to soldiers were distributed amongst his legions, and Cominius Antisida forbade to appear in his presence. Caesar, concerned for his misfortune, broke with ignominy the officers whose instructions were to secure the coast, and advanced to a certain degree into the main sea to protect and facilitate the approach of the transports, but who had neglected their duty on that important station. Chapter 47 about this time, a most incredible accident befell Caesar's army. For the Pleiades being set, about the second watch of the night, a terrible storm arose, attended by hail of an uncommon size. But what contributed to render this mis misfortune the greater was that Caesar had not, like other generals, put his troops into winter quarters, but was every three or four days changing his camp to gain ground on the enemy, which, keeping the soldiers continually employed, they were utterly unprovided with any conveniences to protect them from the inclemency of the weather. Besides, he had brought over his army from Sicily with such strictness that neither officer nor soldier had been permitted to take their equipages or utensils with them, nor so much as a vessel or a single slave, and so far had they been from acquiring or providing themselves with anything in Africa, that on account of the great scarcity of provisions they had even consumed their former stores. Impoverished by these accidents, very few of them had tents. The rest had made themselves a kind of covering, either by spreading their clothes or with mats and rushes. But these being soon penetrated by the storm and hail, the soldiers had no resource left, but wandered up and down the camp, covering their heads with their bucklers to shelter them from the violence of the weather. In a short time, the whole camp was under water, the fires extinguished, and all their provisions washed away or spoiled. The same night, the shafts of the javelins, belonging to the 5th Legion, of their own accord, caught fire. Chapter 48 In the meantime... King Juba, having been informed of the cavalry actions with Scipio, and being earnestly solicited by letters from that general to come to his assistance, left Sabira at home with part of the army to carry on the war against Situus, Sidious, and that he might add the weight of his authority to free Scipio's troops from the dread that they had of Caesar, began his march with three legions, eight hundred regular horse, a body of Numidian cavalry, great numbers of light-armed infantry, and thirty elephants. When he arrived, he lodged himself with those forces which I have described in a separate camp, at no great distance from that of Scipio. Great alarm had prevailed for some time previously in Caesar's camp, and the report of his reproach had increased and produced a general suspense and expectation among the troops. But his arrival and the appearance of his camp soon dispelled all these apprehensions, and they despised the king of Mauritania, now that he was present, as much as they had feared him when at a distance. After this junction, any one might easily perceive that Scipio's courage and confidence were increased by the arrival of the king, for next day, drawing out all his own and royal forces with sixty elephants, he ranged to them in order of battle with great ostentation, advancing a little beyond his entrenchments, and after a short stay, retreated to his camp. Chapter 49 Caesar, knowing that Scipio had received all the supplies he expected, and judging he would no longer decline coming to an engagement, began to advance along the ridge with his forces, extending his lines, to secure them with redoubts, and possess himself of the eminences between him and Scipio. The enemy, confiding in their, in their numbers, seized a neighboring hill, and thereby prevented the progress of our works. Labienus had formed the design of securing this post, and as it lay nearest his quarters, soon got to there. Chapter 50 There was a broad and deep valley of rugged descent, broken with caves, which Caesar had to pass before he could come to the hill which he wished to occupy, and beyond which was a thick grove of old olives. Labienus, perceiving that Caesar must march this way, and having a perfect knowledge of the country, placed himself in ambush with the light-armed foot and part of the cavalry. At the same time, he disposed some horse behind the walls, that when he should fall unexpectedly upon Caesar's foot, they might suddenly advance from behind the mountain 
and thus Caesar and his army, being attacked in front and rear, surrounded, surrounded with danger on all sides, and unable either to retreat or advance, would, he imagined, fall an easy prey to his victorious troops. Caesar, who had no suspicion of the ambush, sent his cavalry f before, and arriving at the place, Labienus's men, either forgetting or neglecting the orders of their general, or fearing to be trampled to death in the ditch by our cavalry, began to issue in small parties from the rock and ascend the hill. Caesar's horse, pursuing them, slew some and took others prisoner. Then, making toward the hill, drove from there Labienus's detachment and immediately took possession. Labienus, with a small party of horse, escaped with great difficulty by flight. Chapter 51. The cavalry, thus having cleared the mountain, Caesar resolved to entrench himself there and distributed the work to the legions. He then ordered two lines of communication to be drawn from the greater camp across the plain on the side of Uzita, which stood between him and the enemy, and was garrisoned by a detachment of Scipio's army, and placed them in such a manner as to meet at the right and left corners of the town. His design in this work was that when he approached the town with his troops and began to attack it, these lines might secure his flanks and hinder the enemy's horse from surrounding him and compelling him to abandon the siege. It likewise gave his men more frequent opportunities of conversing with the enemy and facilitated the means of desertion to such as favored his cause, many of whom had already come over, though not without great danger to themselves. He wanted also by drawing nearer the cavalry to see if they really intended to come to an action, and in, a, and in addition to all these reasons, that the place itself being very low, he might there sink some wells, whereas before he had a long and troublesome way to send for water. While the legions were employed in these works, part of the army stood ready drawn up before the trenches and had frequent skirmishes with the Numidian horse and light armed foot. Chapter 52. A little before evening, when Caesar was drawing off his legions from the works, Juba, Scipio, and Labienus, at the head of all their horse and light armed foot, fell furiously upon his cavalry, who, being overwhelmed by the sudden and general attack of such a multitude, were forced to give ground a little. But the event was very different from what the enemy expected, for Caesar, leading back his legions to the assistance of his cavalry, they immediately rallied, turned upon the Numidians, and charging them vigorously while they were dispersed and disordered with the pursuit, drove them with great loss to the king's camp, and slew several of them, and had not night intervened, and the dust raised by the wind obstructed the prospect, Juba and Labienus would both have fallen into Caesar's hands, and their whole cavalry and light-armed infantry have been cut off. Meanwhile, Scipio's men of the 4th and 6th legions left him in crowds, some deserting to Caesar's camp, others fleeing to such places as were most convenient for them. Curio's horse, likewise, distrusting Scipio and his troops, followed the same counsel. Chapter 53. While these things were being carried on by Caesar and his opponents around Uzita, Two legions, the ninth and tenth, sailing in transports from Sicily, when they came before Ruspina, observing Caesar's ships that lay at anchor about Thapsus, and fearing it might be the enemy's fleet stationed there to intercept them, imprudently stood out to sea, and after being tossed by the wind and harassed by thirst and famine, at last arrived at Caesar's camp. Chapter 54 Soon after these legions were landed, Caesar, calling to mind their former licentious behavior in Italy, and the rapines of some of their officers, seized the slight pretext fur furnished by Gaius Avianus, a military tribune of the 10th legion, who, when he set out for Sicily, filled a ship entirely with his own slaves and horses, without taking on board a single soldier. Wherefore, summoning all the military tribunes and centurions to appear before his tribunal next day, he addressed them in these terms. Quote, I could have wished that those whose insolence and former licentious character had given me cause of complaint had been capable of amendment and of making a good use of my mildness, patience, and moderation. 
but since they know not how to confine themselves within due bounds, I intend to make an example of them according to the law of arms in order that others may be taught a better conduct. Because you, Gaius Avianus, when you were in Italy, instigated the soldiers of the Roman people to revolt from the Republic, and have been guilty of rapines and plunders in the municipal towns, and because you have never been of any real service either to the commonwealth or to your general, and in lieu of soldiers have crowded the transports with your slaves and equipage, so that through your fault the Republic is in want of soldiers, who at this time are not only useful but necessary, for all these causes I break you with ignominy and order you to leave Africa this very day. In like manner, I break you, Aulus Fonteus, because you have behaved yourself as a seditious officer and as a bad citizen. You, Titus Salianus, Marcus Tiro, Gaius Cusinus, have attained the rank of centurions through my indulgence, and not through your own merit. And since you have been invested with that rank, have neither shown bravery in war nor good conduct in peace, and have been more zealous in raising seditions and exciting the soldiers against your general than in observing forbearance and moderation. I therefore think you unworthy of continuing as centurions in my army. I break you, and order you to quit Africa as soon as possible. Having concluded the speech, he delivered them over to some centurions with orders to confine them separately on board a ship, allowing each of them a single slave to wait on them. Meantime, the Catulian deserters, whom Caesar had sent home with letters and instructions, as we related above, arrived among their countrymen, who, partly swayed by their authority, partly by the name and reputation of Caesar, revolted from Juba and speedily and unanimously taking up arms, scrupled not to act in the opposition to their king. Juba, having thus three wars to sustain, was compelled to detach six cohorts from the army destined to act against Caesar, and send them to defend the frontiers of his kingdom against the Gatulians. Chapter 56 Caesar, having finished his lines of communication, and pushed them so near the town as to be just out of reach of Dart, entrenched himself there. He caused warlike engines in great numbers to be placed in the front of his works, wherewith he played perpetually against the town, and to increase the enemy's apprehensions drew five legions out of his other camp. When this opportunity was presented, several persons of eminence and distinction earnestly requested an interview with their friends, and held frequent conferences which Caesar foresaw would turn to his advantage. For the chief officers of the, of the Gatulian horse with other illustrious men of that nation, whose fathers had served under Gaius Marius, and from his bounty obtained considerable estates in their country, but after Scylla's victory had been made tributaries to King Hiempsal, taking advantage of the night, when the fires were lighted, they came over to Caesar's camp near Uzita, with their horses and servants to the number of about a thousand. Chapter 57 when Scipio and his party learned this, and were much annoyed at the disaster, they perceived much about the same time Marcus Aquinius in discourse with Gaius Caesarina. Scipio sent him word that he did not do well to correspond with the enemies. Aquinius, however, paid no attention to this reprimand, but pursued his discourse. Soon after, one of Juba's guards came to him and told him, In the hearing of Caesarina, the king forbids you to continue this conversation. He, being terrified by, the, by this order, immediately retired and obeyed the command of the king. One cannot wonder enough at this step in a Roman citizen, who had already attained to considerable honors in the commonwealth, that though neither banished from his country nor stripped of his possessions, he should pay a more ready obedience to the orders of a foreign prince than those of Scipio, and choose rather to behold the destruction of his party than return into the bosom of his country. And still greater insolence was shown by Juba, not to Marcus Aquinius, a man of no family and an inconsiderable senator, but even to Scipio himself, a man of illustrious birth, distinguished honors, and high dignity in the state. For as Scipio, before the king's arrival, always wore a purple coat of mail, Juba is reported to have told him that he ought not to wear the same habit as he did. Accordingly, Scipio changed his purple robe for a white one, submitting to Juba, a most haughty and insolent monarch. Chapter 58. Next day they drew out all their forces from both camps, and forming them on, the em on an eminence not far from Caesar's camp, continued thus in order of battle. Caesar likewise drew out his men, and disposed them in battle array before his lines, not doubting, but that the enemy, who exceeded him in number of troops, and had been so considerably reinforced by the arrival of King Juba, would advance to attack him. 
Wherefore, having ridden through the ranks, encouraged his men, and gave them the signal of battle, he stayed, awaiting the enemy's charge. For he did not think it advisable to remove far from his lines, because the enemy ha having a strong garrison in Uzida, which was opposite to his right wing, he could not advance beyond that place without exposing his flank to a sally from the town. He was also deterred by the following reason, because the ground before Scipio's army was very rough, and he thought it likely to disorder his men in the charge. Chapter 59. And I think that I ought not to admit to describe the order of battle of both armies. Scipio drew up his troops in the following manner. He posted his own legions and those of Juba in the front, behind them the Numidians, as a body of reserve, but in so very thin ranks and so far extended in length that to see them at a distance you would have taken the main body for a simple line of legionaries, which was doubled only upon the wings. He placed elephants at equal distances on the right and left, and supported them by the light-armed troops and auxiliary Numidians. All the regular cavalry were on the right, for the left was covered by the town of Zuzita, nor had the cavalry room to extend themselves on that side. Accordingly, he stationed the Numidian horse with an incredible multitude of light-armed foot about a thousand paces from his right, towards the foot of a mountain, considerably removed from his own and the enemy's troops. He did so with this intention that when the two armies should engage, his cavalry at the start of the action should take a long sweep enclose Caesar's army and throw them into confusion by their darts. Such was Scipio's disposition. Chapter 16 Caesar's order of battle, to describe it from left to right, was arranged in the following manner. The 9th and 8th legions formed the left wing, the 13th, 14th, 28th, and 26th the main body, and the 13th and 28th the right. His second line on the right consisted partly of the cohorts of those legions we have already mentioned, partly of the new levies. His third line was posted to the left, extending as far as the middle legion of the main body, and so disposed that the left wing formed a triple order of battle. The reason of this disposition was because his right wing being defended by the works, it behooved him to make his left stronger, that they might be a match for the numerous cavalry of the enemy, for which reason he had placed all his horse there, intermixed with light-armed troops, as he could not rely much upon them, and detached the 5th legion to sustain them. He placed archers up and down the field, but principally in the two wings. Chapter 61. The two armies thus facing one another in order of battle, with a space of no more than 300 paces between them, continued thus posted from morning till night without fighting, of which perhaps there was never an instance before. But when Caesar began to retreat within his lines, suddenly all the Numidian and Getulian horse, without bridles, who were posted behind the enemy's army, made a motion to the right and began to approach Caesar's camp on the mountain, while the regular cavalry under Labienus continued in their post to keep our legions in check. Upon this, part of Caesar's cavalry, with the light-armed foot, advanced hastily and without orders against the Getulians, and venturing to even pass the morass, found themselves unable to deal with the superior multitude of the enemy, and being abandoned by the light-armed troops, were forced to retreat in great disorder, after the loss of one trooper. Twenty-six light-armed troops and many of their horse wounded. Scipio, overjoyed at this success, returned towards night to, the, to his camp, but fortune determined not to give such unalloyed joy to those engaged in war, for the day after a party of horse sent by Caesar to Leptis in quest of provisions, falling in unexpectedly with some Numidian and Getulian stragglers, killed or made prisoner about a hundred of them. Caesar, Meanwhile, omitted not every day to draw out his men and labor at the works, carrying a ditch and rampart quite across the plain, to prevent the incursions of the enemy. Scipio, likewise, drew lines opposite to Caesar's, and used great exertions lest Caesar should cut off his communication with the mountain. Thus, both generals were busied with their, with their entrenchments, yet, yet not a, sel a day seldom passed without some skirmish between the cavalry.
chapter 62. In the meantime, Varus, upon notice that the 7th and 8th legions had sailed from Sicily, speedily equipped the fleet he had brought to winter at Utica, and manning it with Gatulian row rowers and mariners, went out a-cruising and came before Adramedum with 55 ships. Caesar, ignorant of his arrival, sent Lucius Cispius with a squadron of 27 sail toward Thapsus to anchor there for the security of his convoys, and likewise dispatched Quintus Aquila to Adramedum with 13 galleys upon the same objective. Cispius soon reached the station appointed to him, but Aquila, being attacked by a storm, could not do double the cape, which obliged him to put in at a creek at some distance that afforded convenient shelter. The rest of the fleet, which remained at sea before Leptis, where the mariners having landed and wandered here and there upon the shore, some having gone into the town for the pur purpose of purchasing provisions, was left quite defenseless. Varus, having notice of this from a deserter, and resolving to take advantage of the enemy's negligence, left Adramedum in Cothon at the commencement of the second watch, and arriving early next morning with his whole fleet before Leptis, burned all the transports that were out at sea, and took without opposition two five bench to galleys, two quinquiremes, in which were none to defend them. Chapter 63. Caesar had an account brought him of this unlucky accident, as he was inspecting the works of his camp, whereupon he immediately took horse, and leaving everything else, went full speed to Leptis, which was but six miles distant, and going on board of the brigantine, ordered all the ships to follow him. He soon came up with Aquila, whom he found dismayed and terrified at the number of ships he had to oppose, and, continuing his course, began to pursue the enemy's fleet. Meantime, Varus, astonished at Caesar's boldness and dispatch, tacked about with his whole fleet and made the best of his way for Adramidum. But Caesar, after four miles of sail, recovered one of his galleys, with the crew and a hundred and thirty of the enemy's men left to guard her, and took a three-benched galley belonging to the enemy which had fallen astern during the engagement, <coughs> with all the soldiers and mariners on board. The rest of the fleet doubled the cape and made the port of Adramedum in Cothon. Caesar could not double the cape with the same wind, but keeping the sea at anchor all night, appeared early next morning before Adramedum. He set fire to all the transports outside of Cothon, and took what galleys he found there, or forced them into the harbor, and having waited some time to offer the enemy battle, returned again to his camp. Chapter 64. On board the ship he had taken was Paulus Vestrius, a Roman knight, and Paulus Ligarius, who had served in Spain under Afranius, the same who had prosecuted the war against him in Spain, and who, instead of acknowledging the conqueror's generosity in granting him his liberty, had joined Pompey in Greece, and after the Battle of Pharsalus, had gone into Africa to Varus, there to continue in the service of the same cause. Caesar, to punish his faithlessness and breach of oath, gave immediate orders for his execution. But he pardoned Paulus Vestrius because his brother had paid his ransom at Rome, and because he himself proved that being taken in Nasidius's fleet and condemned to die, he had been saved by the kindness of Varus, since which there had been no opportunity of making an escape. Chapter 65 it is the custom of the people of Africa to deposit their corn privately in vaults, underground, to secure it in time of war, and guard it from the sudden incursions of an enemy. Caesar, having intelligence of this from a spy, drew out two legions with a party of cavalry at midnight, and sent them about ten miles off, from which they returned loaded with corn to the camp. Labienus, being informed of it, marched about seven miles through the mountain Caesar had passed the day before, and there encamped with two legions, where, expecting that Caesar would often come the same way in quest of corn, he daily lay in ambush with a great body of horse and light-armed foot. Chapter 66 Caesar, being informed of the ambush of Labienus by deserters, delayed there a few days till the enemy, by repeating the practice, often had abated a little in their circumspection. Then, suddenly, one morning, ordering eight veteran legions with part of the cavalry to follow him by the Decuman Gate, he sent for the rest of the cavalry, who, coming suddenly upon the enemy's light-armed foot that lay in ambush among the valleys, slew about five hundred and put the rest to, to flight. Meantime, Labienus advanced with all his cavalry to support the fugitives, and was on the point of overpowering our small force with his numbers, when suddenly Caesar appeared with the legions in order of battle. This sight checked the ardor of Labienus, who thought proper to sound a retreat. The day after, Juba ordered all the Numidians who had deserted their post and fled to their camp to be crucified. 
chapter 67. Meanwhile, Caesar, being distressed by want of corn, recalled all his forces to the camp, and having left garrisons at Leptis, Vespina, and Asilla, ordered Cispius and Aquila, Aquila to blockade with their fleets, the one Adramedum, the other Thapsus, and setting fire to his camp at Uzida, he set out in order of battle at the fourth watch, disposed his baggage on the left, and came to Agar, which had off, been often vigorously attacked by the Getulians and is, valiant, and is valiantly defended by the inhabitants. There, encamping in the plain before the town, he went with part of his army round the country in quest of provisions. And having found a large store of barley, oil, wine, and figs, with a small quantity of wheat, after allowing his troops some time to refresh themselves, he returned to his camp. Scipio, meanwhile, hearing of Caesar's departure, followed him along the hills with all his forces, and posted him about six miles off in three different camps. Chapter 68. The town of Zeta, lying on Scipio's side of the country, was not above ten miles from his camp, but might be about eighteen from that of Caesar. Scipio had sent two legions there to forage, which C Caesar, having intelligence of from a deserter, removed his camp from the plain to a hill for the greater security. and leaving a garrison there, marched at three in the morning with the rest of his forces, passed the enemy's camp, and possessed himself of the town. He found that Scipio's legions were gone further into the country to forage, against whom, setting out immediately, he found that the whole army had come up to their assistance, which obliged him to give up the pursuit. He took on this occasion Gaius Mutius Reginus, a Roman knight, Scipio's intimate friend and governor of the town, also Paulus Atreus, a Roman knight of the province of Utica, with 22 camels belonging to King Juba. Then, leaving a garrison in the place under the command of Oppius, his lieutenant, he returned to his own camp. Chapter 69. As he drew near Scipio's camp, by which he was obliged to pass, Labienus and Ephranius, who lay in ambush among the nearest hills, with all their cavalry and light-armed infantry, started up and attacked his rear. When Caesar perceived this, he detached his cavalry to receive their charge, ordered the legions to throw all their baggage into a heap, and face about upon the enemy. No sooner was this order executed than, upon the first charge of the legions, the enemy's horse and light-armed foot began to give way, and were with incredible ease driven from the higher ground. But when Caesar, supposing them sufficiently deterred from any further attempts, began to pursue his march, they again issued from the hills, and the Numidians, with the light-armed infantry, who are wonderfully nimble, and accustom themselves to fight intermixed with the horse, that is, with their cavalry, with whom they keep an equal pace, either in advancing or retreating, fell a second time upon our foot, as they repeated this often, pressing upon our troops when we marched, and then retreating when we endeav endeavored to engage, always keeping at a certain distance, and with circular care avoiding a close fight, and considering it enough to wound us with their darts. Caesar plainly saw that their whole aim was to oblige him to encamp in that place, where no water was to be had, that his soldiers, who had tasted nothing from three in the morning till four in the afternoon, might perish with hunger, and the cattle with thirst. Chapter 70 When sunset now approached, and Caesar found he had not gained a hundred paces in four hours, and that, by keeping his cavalry in the rear, he lost many horse, he ordered the legions to fall behind and close the march. Proceeding thus with a slow and gentle pace, he found the legions fitter to sustain the enemy's charge. Meantime, the Numidian horse, wheeling round the hills to the right and left, threatened to enclose Caesar's forces with their numbers, while part continued to harass his rear. And if but three or four veteran soldiers faced about and darted their javelins at the enemy, no less than two thousand of them would take to flight, but suddenly rallying return to the fight, and charged the legionaries with their darts. Thus Caesar, at one time marching forward, at another halting, and going on but slowly, 
reached the camp safe about seven that evening, having only ten men wounded. Labienus, too, reached to his camp after having thoroughly fatigued his troops with the chase, in which, besides a great number wounded, his loss amounted to about three hundred men. And Scipio withdrew his legions and elephants, whom, for the greater terror, he had ranged before the camp within view of Caesar's army. Chapter 71 Caesar, to meet enemies of this sort, was necessitated to instruct his soldiers, not like a general of a veteran army which had been victorious in so many battles, but like a fencing master training up his gladiators, with what foot they must advance or retire, when they were to oppose and make good their ground, when to counterfeit an attack, at what place, in what manner to launch their javelins, for the enemy's light-armed troops gave wonderful trouble and annoyance to our army, because they not only deterred the cavalry from the encounter, but by c killing their horses with their javelins, but likewise wearied out the legionary soldiers by their swiftness. For as often as these heavy armed troops advanced to attack them, they evaded the danger by a quick retreat. Chapter 72 Caesar was rendered very anxious by these occurrences, because as often as he engaged with his cavalry, without being supported by the infantry, he found himself by no means a match for the enemy's horse, supported by their light armed foot. And as he had no experience of the strength of their legions, he foresaw still greater difficulties when these should be united, as the shock then must be overwhelming. In addition to this, the number and size of the elephants greatly increased the terror of the soldiers, for which, however, he found a remedy, in causing some of those animals to be brought over from Italy, that his men might be accustomed to the sight of them, know their strength and courage, and in what part of the body they were most vulnerable. For as the elephants are covered with trappings and ornaments, it was necessary to inform them what parts of the body remained naked, that they might direct their darts to there. It was likewise needed to familiarize his horses to the cry, smell, and figure of these animals, in all of which he succeeded to a wonder, for the soldiers quickly came to touch them with their hands and to be sensible of their tardiness, and the cavalry attacked them with blunted darts, and by degrees brought their horses to endure their presence. Chapter 73 for these reasons already mentioned, Caesar was very anxious, and proceeded with more slowness and circumspection than usual, abating considerably in his accustomed expedition and celerity. Nor ought we to wonder, for in Gaul he had under him troops accustomed to fight in a champagne country, against an open undesigning enemy, who despised artifice, and valued themselves only on their bravery. But now he was to habituate his soldiers to the arts and contrivances of a crafty enemy, and teach them what to pursue and what to avoid. The sooner, therefore, to instruct them in these matters, he took care not to confine his legions to one place, but under pretense of foraging engaged them in frequent marches and countermarches, because he thought that the enemy's troops would not lose his track. Three days after, he drew up his forces with great skill and marching past Scipio's camp, waited for him in an open plain, but seeing that he still declined to battle, he retreated to his camp a little before evening. Chapter 74 Meantime, ambassadors arrived from the town of Vaca, bordering upon Zeta, of which we have observed Caesar had possessed himself. They requested and entreated that he would send them a garrison, promising to furnish men many of the necessaries of war. At the same time, by the will of the gods, it says, and their kindness to Caesar, a disorder informed him that Juba had, by a quick march, before Caesar's troops could arrive, reached the town and surrounded it and after taking possession of it, massacred the inhabitants, and abandoned the place itself to the plunder of his soldiers. Chapter 75 Caesar, having reviewed his army the twelfth day before the calends of April, advanced next day with all his forces five miles beyond his camp, and remained a considerable time in order of battle, two miles from Scipio's, when he saw distinctly that the enemy, though frequently and for a long time challenged to a battle, declined it, he led back his troops. Next day he, he decamped, and directed his march toward Sarsora, where Scipio had a garrison of Numidians and a magazine of corn. Labienus, being informed of this motion, began to harass his rear with the cavalry and light-armed troops, and having made himself master of part of the baggage, was encouraged to attack the legions themselves, believing they would fall an easy prey under the load and encumbrance of a march. However, this circumstance had not escaped Caesar's attention, for he had ordered three hundred men out of each legion to hold themselves in readiness for action. These being sent against Labienus, he was so terrified at their approach that he shamefully took to flight, great numbers of his men being killed or wounded. The legionaries returned to their standards and pursued their march. 
Labienus continued to follow us at a distance along the summit of the mountains on our right. Chapter 76. Caesar, arriving before Sarsura, took it in presence of the enemy, who durst not advance to its relief, and put to the sword the garrison which had been left there by Scipio, under the command of Paulus Cornelius, one of Scipio's veterans, who, after a vigorous defense, was surrounded and slain. Having given all the corn in the place to the army, he marched next day to Tisra, where Considius was with a strong garrison and his cohort of gladiators. Caesar, having taken a view of the town, and being deterred from besieging it by need of corn, set out immediately, and after a march of four miles, encamped near a river. He marched from it on the fourth day, and then returned to his former camp at Agar. Scipio did the same, and retreated to his old quarters. Chapter 77. Meantime, the inhabitants of Tabena, a nation situated on the extreme confines of Juba's kingdom, along the sea coast, and who had been accustomed to live in subjection to that monarch, having massacred the garrison left there by their king, sent deputies to Caesar to inform him of what they had done, and to beg he would take under his protection a city which deserved so well of the Roman people. Caesar, approving their conduct, sent Marcus Crispius in the tribune with a cohort, a party of archers, and a great number of engines of war to charge himself with the defense of Thabena. At the same time, the legionary soldiers, who either on account of sickness or for other reasons hadn't been able to come over into Africa with all the rest, to the number of about 4,000 foot, 400 horse, and 1,000 archers and sling slingers, reached Caesar by one embarkation. With these and his former troops, he arrived into a plain eight miles distant from his own camp and four from that of Scipio, where he awaited the enemy in order of battle. Chapter 78. There was a town below Scipio's camp of the name of Tegea, where he had a garrison of four hundred horse. These he drew up on the right and left of the town, and bringing forth his legions, formed them in order of battle upon a hill somewhat lower than his camp, and which was about a thousand paces distant from it. After he had continued a considerable time in one place, without offering to make any attempt, Caesar sent some squadrons of horse, supported by his light-armed infantry archers and slingers, to charge the enemy's cavalry who were on duty before the camp. After Caesar's troops advanced and came to the charge with their horses at a gallop, Placidius began to extend his front, that he might at once surround us and give us a warm reception. Upon this, Caesar detached three hundred legionaries to our assistance, while at the same time Labienus was continually sending fresh reinforcements to replace those that were wounded or fatiguing. Our cavalry, who were only 400 in number, not being able to sustain the charge of 4,000, and being at besides greatly harassed by the light-armed Numidians, began at last to give ground, which Caesar observing detached the other wing to their assistance, who, joining those that were like near to be overpowered, fell in a body upon the enemy, put them to flight, slew or wounded great numbers, pursued them three miles quite to the mountains, and then returned to their own men. Caesar continued in order of battle till four in the afternoon, and then retreated to camp without the loss of a man. In this action, Placidius received a dangerous wound in, wound in the head, and many of his best officers either killed or wounded. Chapter 79 After he found that he could not by any means induce the enemy to come down to the plain and make an attempt on his legions, and that he could not encamp nearer them for need of water, in consideration of which alone, and not for any confidence in their numbers, the Africans had dared to despise him, he decamped the day before the Nones of April at midnight, marched sixteen miles beyond Agar to Thapsus, where Virgilius commanded with a strong garrison, and there fixed his camp and began to surround the town the very day on which he arrived, and raised redoubts in proper places, as well for his own security as to prevent any succors from entering the town. In the meantime, Scipio, on learning Caesar's designs, was reduced to the necessity of fighting, to avoid the disgrace of abandoning Virgilius and the Thapsitani, who had all along remained firm to his party, and therefore following Caesar without delay, he posted himself in two camps eight miles from Thapsus. Chapter 80 Now there were some salt pits, between which and the, or morasses, between which and the sea was a narrow pass of about 1,500 paces. It doesn't say which direction the 1,500 paces. By which Scipio endeavored to penetrate and carry succor to the inhabitants of Thapsus. But Caesar, anticipating that this might happen, had the day before raised a very strong fort at the entrance of it, in which he left a triple garrison, and encamping 
with the rest of his troops in the form of a lunette half-moon, carried his works around the town. Scipio, disappointed in his design, passed the day and night following a little above the morass. But early next morning, advanced within a small distance of the last-mentioned camp and fort, where he began, began to entrench himself with about 1,500 pig paces from the sea. Caesar, being informed of this, drew off his men from the works, and leaving Asprenus, the proconsul, with two legions at the camp, marched all the rest of his forces with the utmost speed to that place. He left part of the fleet before Thapsus, and ordered the rest to make, come as near the shore as possible toward, toward the enemy's rear, observing the signal he should give them, upon which they were to raise a sudden shout that the enemy, alarmed and disturbed by the noise behind them, might be forced to turn around and look. Chapter 81 When Caesar came to the place, he found Scipio's army in order to, of battle before the entrenchments. The elephants posted on the right and left wings, and part of the soldiers ba busily employed in fortifying the camp. Upon sight of this disposition, he drew up his army in three lines, placing the 10th and 2nd legions on the right, the 8th and 9th on the left, five legions in the center, covered his flanks with five cohorts, posted opposite the elephants, disposed the archers and slingers in the two wings, and intermingled the light-armed troops with his cavalry. He himself, on foot, went from rank to rank to rouse the courage of the veterans, putting them in mind of their former victories and animating them by his kind expressions. He exhorted the new levies, who had never yet been in battle, to emulate the brav bravery of the veterans and endeavor by a victory to attain the same degree of fame, glory, and renown. Chapter 82 as he ran from rank to rank, he observed the enemy about the camp, very uneasy, hurrying from place to place, at one time retiring behind the rampart, another coming out again in great tumult and confusion. As many others in the army began to observe this, his lieutenants and volunteers begged him to give the signal for battle, as, it says, the immortal gods promised him a decisive victory. While he hesitated and strove to repress their eagerness and desire, exclaiming that it was not his wish to commence the battle by a sudden sally, at the same time keeping back his army, all of a sudden a trumpeter in the right wing, without Caesar's leave, but forced by the soldiers, sounded a charge. Upon this, all the cohorts began to rush toward the enemy, in spite of the endeavors of the centurions, who strove to restrain them by force, lest they should charge without the general's order, but to no purpose. Chapter 83. Caesar, perceiving that the ardor of his soldiers would admit of no restraint, giving, quote, good fortune, as the watchword, spurred on his horse, and charged the enemy's front. On the right wing, the archers and slingers poured their eager javelins without intermission upon the elephants, and by the noise of their slings and stones, so terrified these animals that, turning upon their own men, they trod them down in heaps, and rushed through the half-finished gates of the camp. At the same time, the Mauritanian horse, who were in the same wing with the elephants, seeing them deprived of their assistance, betook themselves to flight, whereupon the legions, wheeling round the elephants, soon possessed themselves of the enemy's entrenchments, and some few that made great resistance being slain, the rest fled with all expedition to the camp that they had abandoned the day before. Chapter 84. And here we must not omit to notice the bravery of a veteran soldier of the 5th Legion. For when an elephant which had been wounded in the left wing and roused to fury by the pain ran against an unarmed camp servant, threw him under his feet and kneeling on him with his whole weight and brandishing his uplift trunk with hideous cries, crushed him to death, the soldier could not refrain from attacking the animal. The elephant, seeing him advance with his javelin in hand, quitted the dead body of the camp servant, and, seeing him with his trunk, wheeled him round in the air. But he, amid all the danger, preserving his presence of mind, ceased not with his sword to strike at the elephant's trunk, which enclasped him, and the animal, at last overcome with the pain, quitted the soldier and fled to the rest with hideous cries. Chapter 85 Meanwhile, the garrison of Thapsus, either designing to assist their friends or abandoning the town to seek safety by flight, 
sallied out of the gate next to the, to the sea, and wading navel deep into the water, endeavored to, to reach the land. But the servants and attendants of the camp, attacking them with darts and stones, forced them to return to the town. Scipio's forces, meanwhile, being beaten, and his men fleeing on all sides, the legions instantly began the pursuit, that they might have no time to rally. When they arrived at the camp to which they fled, and where, having repaired it, they hoped to defend themselves, they began to think of choosing a commander to whose authority and orders they might submit. But finding none of on whom they could rely, they threw down their arms and fled to the king's quarter. Finding this, on their arrival, occupied by Caesar's forces, they retired to a hill where, despairing of safety, they cast down their arms and saluted them in a military manner. But this afforded them nothing, for the veterans, transported with rage and anger, not only could not be induced to spare the enemy, but even killed or wounded several citizens of distinction in their own army, whom they abraded as authors of the war. Of this number was Tullius Rufus, the quaestor, whom a soldier designed intentionally ran through with a javelin, and Pompeius Rufus, who was wounded with a sword in the arm, and would doubtless have been slain had he not speedily fled to Caesar for protection. This made several Roman knights and senators retire from the battle, lest the soldiers, who after so signal a victory assumed an unbounded license, should be induced by the hopes of impunity to wreak their fury on them likewise. In short, all Scipio's soldiers, Scipio's soldiers at this place, let's say, though they implored the protection of Caesar, were in the very sight of that general, and in spite of his entreaties to his men to spare them, without exception put to the sword. Chapter 86 Caesar, having made himself master of the enemy's three camps, killed ten thousand, only, let's say, and putting the rest to flight, retreated to his own quarters with the loss of not more than fifty men and a few wounded. In this way, he appeared before the town of Thapsus, and ranged all the elephants he had captured in battle, amounting to sixty-four, with their ornaments, trappings, and castles, in full view of the place. This he did in hopes that possibly Virgilius and those that were besieged with him might give over the idea of resistance on learning of the defeat of their friends. He even called and invited him to submit, reminding him of his clemency and mildness. But no answer being given, he retired from before the town. Next day, after returning thanks to the gods, it says, he assembled his army before Thapsus, praised his soldiers in the presence of the inhabitants, rewarded the victorious, and from his tribunal extended his bounty to everyone, according to their merit and services. Setting out from there immediately, he left the proconsul Gaius Rebellius with three legions to continue the siege, and sent Gnaeus Domitius with two to invest Tisdra, where Considius commanded. Then ordering Marcus Messala to go be in front with the cavalry, he began his march toward Utica. Chapter 87. Scipio's cavalry, who had, who had escaped out of the battle, taking the road to Utica, arrived at Parada. But being refused admittance by the inhabitants, who heard of Caesar's victory, they forced the gates lighted a great fire in the midst, middle of the forum, and threw all the inhabitants into it, without distinction of age or sex, with their effects, avenging in this manner, by an unheard of cruelty, the affront they had received. From there they marched directly to Utica. Marcus Cato, some time before, distrusting the inhabitants of the city, on account of the privileges granted them by the Julian law, had disarmed and expelled the populace, obliging them to dwell outside the warlike gate, in a small camp surrounded by a slight entrenchment, around which he had planted guards, while at the same time he put the senators under arrest. The cavalry attacked their camp, knowing them to be favorers of Caesar, and intending to wipe out by their destruction the, the disgrace of their defeat. But the people, animated by Caesar's victory, repulsed them with stones and clubs. They therefore threw themselves into the town, killed many of the inhabitants, and pillaged their houses. Cato, unable to prevail with them to abstain from ra rapine and slaughter, and undertake the defense of the town, as he was not ignorant of what they aimed at, gave each a hundred sesterces to make them quiet. Scylla Faustus did the same out of his own money, and marching with them from Utica, advanced into the kingdom. Chapter 88 
A great many others that had escaped out of, the, out of the battle fled to Utica. These Cato assembled with 300 more who had furnished Scipio with money for carrying on the war, and exhorted them to set their slaves free and in conjunction with them defend the town. But finding that, though part assembled, the rest were terrified and determined to, to flee, he gave over the attempt and furnished to them with ships to facilitate their escape. He himself, having settled all his affairs with the utmost care, commended his children to Lucius Caesar, his quaestor, without the least indication which might give cause of suspicion, or any change in his countenance and behavior, privately carried a sword into his chamber when he retired to rest and stabbed himself with it. When the wound would not prove mortal, he fell heavily to the ground, his physician and friends sus suspecting what was going on, burst into the room and began to stanch and bind up his wound. He himself most resolutely tore it back open and met death with the greatest determination. The Eutychans, though they hated his party, yet in consideration of his singular integrity, his behavior so different from that of the other leaders, and because he had strengthened their town with wonderful fortifications and increased the towers, interred him honorably. Lucius Caesar, that he might procure some advantage by his death, assembled the people, and after haranguing them, exhorted them to open their gates and throw themselves upon Caesar's clemency, from which they had the greatest reason to hope the best. This advice being followed, he came forth to meet Caesar. Messala, having reached Utica, according to his orders, placed guards at the gates. Chapter 89 Meanwhile, Caesar, leaving Thapsus, came to Usceta, where Scipio had laid up a great store of corn, arms, darts, and other warlike provisions under a small guard. He soon made himself master of the place and marched directly to Abramedum, which he entered without opposition. He took an account of the arms, provisions, and money in the town, pardoned Quintus Ligarius and Gaius Considius, and leaving Livinaeus Regulus there with one legion, set out the next day for Utica. Lucius Caesar, meeting him by the way, threw himself at his feet and only begged for his life. Caesar, according to his wanted clemency, easily pardoned him, as he did likewise Caecina, Gaius Ateus, Paulus Atreus, Lucius Sella, father and son, Marcus Epius, Marcus Aquinius, Cato's son, and the children of Damasippus. He arrived at Utica in the evening by torchlight and continued all that night outside the town. Chapter 90 Early in the morning of the following day, he entered the place, summoned an assembly of the people, and thanked them for their affection they had shown to his cause. At the same time, he censured severely and enlarged upon the crime of the Roman citizens and merchants and the rest of the three hundred who had furnished Scipio and Varus with money, but concluding with telling them that they might show themselves without fear, as he was resolved to grant them their lives and content himself with exposing their effects to sale, but that he would give them notice when their goods were to be sold, and the liberty of redeeming them upon payment of a certain fine. The merchants, half dead with fear, and conscious that they merited death, hearing upon what terms life was offered them, greedily accepted the condition, and entreated Caesar that he would impose a certain sum in gross upon all the three hundred. Accordingly, he immersed, A-M-E-R-C-E-D, them in 200,000 sesterces to be paid to the Republic at six equal payments within the space of three years. They all accepted the condition and considering that day as a second nativity, joyfully returned thanks to Caesar. Chapter 91. Meanwhile, King Juba, who had escaped from the battle with Petraeus, hiding himself all day in the villages and traveling only at night, arrived at last in Numidia. When he came to Zama, his ordinary place of residence, where were his wives and children, with all his treasures, and whatever he held most valuable, and which he had strongly fortified at the beginning of the war, the inhabitants, having heard of Caesar's victory, refused him admission, because upon declaring war against the Romans, he had raised a mighty pile of wood in the middle of the forum, designing, if successful, to massacre all of the citizens, fling their bodies and effects upon the pile, then setting fire to the mass and throwing himself upon it, destroy all without exception, wives, children, citizens, treasures, in one great conflagration. After continuing a considerable time in front of the gates, finding that neither threats nor entreaties would avail, 
he at last desired them to deliver up his wives and children, that he might carry them along with him. But receiving no answer, and seeing them determined to grant him nothing, he quitted the place and retired to one of his country seats with Petraeus and a few horse. Chapter 92. Meantime, the Zamians sent ambassadors to Caesar at Utica to inform him of what they had done and to request that he should send them aid. The End Thus was completed the uncontested triumph of Caesar as the first of the seven heads of the prophesied fourth beast of Daniel, the Roman Empire, prophesied to be terrible and dreadful and exceedingly strong, to have great iron teeth and to devour and break in pieces and stamp the resident with his feet. Indeed, also prophesied to be the platform upon which the harlot of Babylon would ride, seducing the kings of the earth and dragging the world down to the depths of vice and depravity. For evil had to be completed and reach its maximum before the light of the world the stone destined to shatter the greatness of men would be born in Bethlehem of Judea. If you liked this video, imagine what else you could learn for free from AncientMiddleEast.com about the Roman era barbarian in realms. Download and open any Google Earth KMZ file and click on any sure yellow pin or unsure red pin or any land feature to find out what ancient place names were there. I also offer a variety of other classical education resources aimed primarily at high schoolers, all at the Classical Ed Offerings links in the video description. A philosophy textbook, free. WriteLatin.org has an automated website to check you for accuracy as you write the Latin that you're learning from the number one Latin textbook, the Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata. And a theology video playlist, also here on this YouTube channel. You can also donate to me by buying anything from my high-tech Latin storefront at teacherspayteachers.com.